Today's topic is soil quality. My name is Ellen Phillips and I'm a local food systems and small farms educator for the University of Illinois Extension. In discussing soil quality, we'll first define what that is and then talk about many of the factors that influence soil quality from physical properties such as structure and bulk density, porosity, water relationships, crusting, and available water. We'll also talk about some of the biological aspects of soil quality, from encouraging a living biological system to the impacts of organic matter in that system. And then lastly, we'll follow up with a quick discussion on some of the management strategies to improve and maintain soil quality. One official definition of soil quality is that it's the capacity of a soil to function within ecosystem boundaries to sustain biological productivity, maintain environmental quality, and promote plant, animal, and human health. As you can see, the actual definition of soil quality depends on your perspective. For farmers, it's a matter of sustaining productivity of that soil in order to maximize yield and therefore profit. Naturalists view soil as a part of the landscape and trying to maintain its sustainability. Environmentalists look at its ability for functioning um, within the ecosystem and ecosystem services such as nutrient cycling or capturing nitrogen and carbon in the ecosystem. Soil quality is important and it certainly can affect many of the things that soils do for the environment, such as providing hospital conditions for life within that soil to providing ecosystem services, such as supporting plant growth, helping nutrients to cycle, holding and releasing water, all the way down to an important one in the climate change of storing carbon. What we do know about soil quality is that it is an integration of many different properties of soil physical properties, biological community and the properties that influence that, and many chemical properties, all of which we're going to visit with you about over the rest of this presentation and how they impact not only soil quality but plant growth. We're going to begin the discussion about soil quality by looking at some of the physical properties that influence soil quality. Listed here are some of the physical factors that affect soil quality, such as soil structure and its relationship to soil porosity, the uh, uh, aggregate stability of that structural unit, the bulk density that impacts compaction, and then the last couple listed there are how those things go together and actually impact then water movement and storage within the soil, such as permeability and infiltration, soil crusting, and available water holding capacity. Soil structure is how we define that natural occurrence of the aggregates or PEDs within the soil and the arrangement that they make. Depending on the size and shape of that structure, they influence a lot of other properties like infiltration and permeability, whether or not there'll be erosion because the water's going um, not in the soil but um, running off that soil. It affects root penetration, how air moves through the soil and overall can impact then and be a demonstration of soil compaction. Soil structure changes over the depth of the soil. On the right hand side you see several different types of structure. If we have a sandy soil you might have single grain structure. It can't form together in an aggregate. Um, if we have a lot of organic matter in the soil, we get finer and finer structures such as the granular structure, which tends to occur in that upper layer or topsoil a horizon of the soil. 
Um, a little bit below that in the subsoil, it's not uncommon at all to have what we call blocky structure. Those stru structural aggregates are a little bit larger in shape, and as a result, there's less porosity in that blocky structure than there would be in the granular structure in the topsoil. Platy structure can be found also, but tends to be a little bit more rare and typically found in a forested soil. Here is just one example of really well-defined soil structure, and you can see then how that influences the type and amount of pore space in that soil, which is going to influence that water movement and um, root growth in that soil. Our management of the soil can dramatically impact soil structure. And here's a good example. This is a field that's been tilled on a very regular basis. And so you can see that that area that's been tilled consistently has had a lot of damage to that structure and has gone back to being structureless versus what's naturally below it where we have really well-defined units and therefore adequate water movement and so forth through that area. So our management of soils uh, is important as it influences structure because we can destroy it and it takes a long time to try and repair that damage. Our management practices can influence the quality of soil structure in the surface whether it's the amount of organic matter we incorporate into the soil via um, manure additions or compost or cover crops to the amount of tillage we do that can either destroy the soil structure or help improve it. All those things then also influence the biological activity of that soil surface that impacts the quality of soil structure. Down below in the subsurface, our subsoil, the texture is a more dominant factor. There's also many other physical factors that influence the creation of soil structure, such as the shrinking and swelling of the clays in the soil, wetting and drying cycles, freezing and thawing is another one that can influence the creation or destruction of soil structure. Brick growth can also have an impact, as well as other soil formation factors. Soil quality is related to soil structure. And one tool to evaluate the quality of that structure is called aggregate stability. It's a method used to evaluate whether or not those aggregates are strong enough to resist disruption. And that disruption can come from a water drop hitting it from a rainstorm to tillage. All those things are important because the stronger the structure, the less erosion we will have, the better infiltration of water and less crusting of that soil surface, the more porosity in that soil because of good structure will have more root growth. So aggregate stability is an important tool to evaluate soil structure. Here is a very good example of the importance of aggregate stability. It's a research demonstration taking samples from a conventional till field on the left, no-till in the center, and grass field on the right. Aggregate stability is where you take those aggregates of similar size, dunk them in the water a few times, slowly moving them up and down in the water, and letting them disperse. And you can see by looking at the size of the aggregates that remain that there's a big difference between those cropping systems and the aggregate stability with the grass system allowing the most stable aggregates that could potentially then resist raindrop impact or a lot of tillage impacts in our management of that soil. There are a number of factors that influence aggregate stability. Organic matter content is one of those. The higher the organic matter content is usually strongly related with stronger aggregate stability. Texture can be an influence as well. The higher the clay content of a soil, generally you'll have higher aggregate stability. Tillage, of course, can disrupt structure. And as a result, the more tillage you have, 
then in general, you will have less aggregate stability. Microbial activity actually is one of the strongest correlations to aggregate stability outside of organic matter, and that's because of fungi. Fungi have what are called hyphae. They're like little arms that go out and grab aggregate uh, particles together and sort of glue them together. The chemical that they have found related to that is a very sticky protein called glomerulin, and it works effectively at binding particles together and increasing the aggregate stability. Bulk density is a measurement related to structure and porosity in the soil. By definition, it's the weight of a volume of soil, and it's a very specific measurement that can be done in a lab um, to get an official bulk density. But it's also an indication of the compaction of the soil. Just think about when you walk across the soil, your weight can press down on that soil, collapsing a lot of the pore space in that soil. And once that pore space is destroyed, it's very hard to get back. And we call that compaction. Well, why is that important? Obviously, if there's not pores in the soil, then roots can't grow, and we don't have much root system in our plants. If there's not open pore space, then air and water will also be restricted in its movement through the soil. If we have compaction and not enough pore space in that soil, then when it rains, the rain is going to run off the soil, creating more and more erosion, rather than infiltrating into the soil. Lastly, it can influence the biological property of our soils, especially those larger creatures, like the insects or earthworms that live in the soil. The harder that soil is, the less pore space, the less they are able to live in that system and help create actually better soil quality for us. Here are a few examples of compaction and how we get compaction. Look at the tire tracks and the depth of that compaction several inches down into the soil as a result of the weight of that tractor. Well, over years, you can actually create what's called a plow pan, and that bottom left picture is an example of that. At the depth of tillage, you get this very, very dense layer of soil that prevents roots from going through that soil layer. The only way to get around that is to go back with a deep chisel or something along those lines to break through that plow layer, and then the roots can follow after that. And you can see that in the upper right picture as well, where you see that compacted layer, and all those roots are sitting on top of that compacted layer, not able to penetrate that really dense, high bulk density soil. The same thing happens with water as it moves through the soil. You can imagine that there would be a perched water table where water would just sit on top of that compacted layer. Soil structure is important because it's very correlated with the amount of open pore space that we have in the soil. And it's that we're in those pores where that water moves and where that air flows through the soil and as a result our uh, roots can also grow. So the porosity of the soil is very closely related to the soil quality. There's many factors that can influence the size and shape and distribution of pores within the soil. Soil aggregates is one of those. If you remember that one of the first slide in the top soil, we tend to have granular structure. It's smaller, well-defined aggregates, and creates a lot of pore space in that A horizon. The larger blocky structure in the subsoil creates less pore space, uh, and as a result, influences a lot of the other factors that we'll talk about here. The amount of plant life, roots growing in the soil, can influence pores. And in fact, roots can act, grow and expand and make thicker the pores within the soil. Animals, as they crawl through the soil, something like earthworms, can actually create pores for us in the soil. Texture certainly is an influence. If we have a very sandy soil, it's hard to create um, uh, larger pores in, in that soil because the aggregates are not as stable as they are in a clay soil. 
the stronger the organic matter content, the stronger the aggregates uh, that we have in the soil, and as a result, we get more pore space in the soil. We've already said that tillage potentially can destroy um, uh, porosity in the soil unless we do something like no-till. Compaction definitely is impacting porosity by eliminating that pore space and collapsing all those aggregates on top of one another. And a plow pan is probably one of the densest layers in the soil with no uh, very, very limited porosity in that layer. Here's an example of how different types of tillage influence various factors to ultimately influence the size and shape of the pores. On the left hand side we have conventional tillage which tends to destroy aggregates and as a result we end up with less porosity. On the right hand side we have an example of 18 years of no-till, a minimal amount of disruption of those aggregates in that soil. And as a result, as earthworms move through that soil and create these larger um, macropores in the soil, they remain there for a long time. That can be very beneficial. It could also lead to some problems if those pores go all the way from the surface to the subsoil and it create a direct conduit of rainwater potentially kept carrying with it fertilizers or pesticides and so there can be advantages and disadvantages but in this case we can see clearly the influence of those earthworms on porosity. Sometimes those pores get really large. Here we're seeing a good example of that where we have ants burrowing on the soil in the right creating some large macropores and even larger are some of the rodents um, and snakes and other things that live in the soil creating fairly large conduits in the soil for water to move very quickly from the surface down below. How quickly water moves through the soil is defined by what we call soil permeability. And here is a concern because if we have a soil where water very quickly moves from the surface, topsoil all the way down through that soil profile, it potentially could pick up fertilizers or pesticides or other things that we've added to that soil and leach them, carry them with the water down through that soil profile and into our aquifers or groundwater polluting them. On the opposite end, we could have a soil that's so dense, like a heavy clay soil, where it's very hard for that water to move into the soil, and as a result, during a heavy rainstorm, most of it runs off and we end up with erosion. So permeability becomes an important factor in how water is going to move in that soil. There's many factors that can influence how quickly water moves through the soil. Texture is an obvious one. If we have a clay soil versus a sandy soil, in a sandy soil, if you apply one inch of water to the surface of that sandy soil, that water can be all the way down through that entire soil profile within about six hours if it's really sandy soil. In a clay soil, that water is probably sitting on top of it still after that six hours. Compaction is certainly another one that can influence the permeability. If we have that really dense compacted layer like a plow layer, that water would sit on top of that plow layer and act like a perched water table. Water is not going to penetrate down through that for a very long time. Porosity certainly is an influence because the size of the pores and the shape of the pores and the continuity of the pores all our factors and influence whether or not the water can move from the surface down below that soil. The structure can also have a great influence. If we have well-defined aggregates and really excellent porosity uh, as a result of the, that strong aggregation, then we have better water movement in that soil than we do if it's compacted. Soil quality is also defined by looking at the infiltration rate of a soil. An infiltration is simply the process by which water actually enters into the soil from the surface, either during a rainstorm or if you're irrigating. It's important because 
we want water to get into the soil because the crop needs to take that water up in order to grow. But oftentimes it doesn't. It will sometimes sit on the surface, in, for instance, in the pictures you see below during a heavy rainstorm. And as a result, if it's not infiltrating into the soil, there's a strong potential for it to run off and erode and result in ponding, sedimentation in the field, and other problems. Defining infiltration is actually a fairly simple test by putting a ring into the soil and adding an inch of water and simply timing how quickly does that water move into the soil. In general, you would expect that if the soil has an excellent aggregation uh, and strong aggregate stability, that there's plenty of open pore space for that water to quickly move into that soil. If we don't have that, you will generally see very slow infiltration and then the potential for runoff and other problems. Infiltration of water into the soil is influenced by many things. We've already seen several cases where uh, soil structure and aggregate st strength influence water movement. If we have a lot of tillage that disrupts that structure and destroys it, uh, particularly if it compacts that soil, then we would expect to have slower infiltration of water into that soil. If we have a very heavy, intense rainstorm, those raindrops are enough to actually pulverize the aggregates that are on the surface, creating that very thin soil crust and as a result preventing water moving into that soil. Organic matter can influence infiltration. Some types of organic matter, especially in horticultural settings like peat moss and um, compost, actually almost fluff up the soil in some ways, creating bigger, more open pore space at the surface, allowing water to more quickly infiltrate into the soil. Biologic activity such as earthworms can certainly influence that. We just saw that in a few slides where some earthworms can leave some fairly big holes for water to quickly move into the soil and go deep down into the profile. Texture is certainly one of those things that can influence infiltration. If you've been on a beach, then you know how quickly water can move through sand, and yet a clay soil, it barely moves. Crop rotation over the long run can also influence infiltration. If we look at cropping studies where we have a lot of grass uh, incorporated into that rotation, for instance a, 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 a corn soybean and pasture rotation or with an alfalfa field in there for hay, then those fields tend to have better infiltration because of the high organic matter and other factors than if it's a straight, uh, for instance, continuous corn field. Here's just one example of what you might look for out in your fields to see whether or not there's a lot of biological activity, particularly from earthworms. These are middens where the earthworms are coming to the surface, gathering their organic matter around their hole, and then they're going up and down in their burrow, taking that organic matter down into the soil uh, throughout the day. Um, this is usually very typical of something like a night crawler. If you have heavy clay soils, you've probably seen something similar to the right picture in your fields at some point in time. It usually happens after a very intense rainstorm, and we call it soil crusting. This is where the aggregates are literally busted apart by very heavy, intense raindrops hitting them and breaking them back down into the soil particles of sand and silt and clay. As a result, they form this dense layer that is so thick that, and dense that it prevents water from infiltrating into the soil. If seed had just been planted, it also can prevent the seed from emerging out of that soil unless that soil crust is broken up. Whether or not we get soil crusting can be influenced by some of our management practices. For instance, there's a strong relationship between organic matter content and structure aggregate stability. 
So the more stable those aggregates are, the less likely that that soil will end up with soil crusts. So the more organic matter we can add to the soil, the better. The intensity of the rain certainly is a factor. We don't usually see soil crusts formed if it's a nice, gentle, one-inch rainstorm. But if it's a very intense thunderstorm where that raindrop is hitting with a tremendous amount of energy, is more likely where we're going to see a soil crust cre being created. Well, how do we prevent soil crusts? As we said, add organic matter that increases structural aggregate stability. But the other way is to prevent those raindrops from even hitting the surface. We can do that in fields by having residue cover, using cover crops, using mulches, or anything else to prevent that raindrop from hitting a bare soil surface. The last thing mentioned there is sodium content, and certainly that can influence the creation of crusts because that destabilizes aggregates. Generally here in Illinois, though, that's not an issue. Most of the times that you see sodium as a problem is in um, drier regions such as the Southwest. So quality is also evaluated by looking at the available water capacity. The available water capacity is simply the amount of water that is held between the field capacity, which is the measurement of the maximum water holding capacity of the soil, and the permanent wilting point, which is that point where even though there might be water in the soil, the plant roots can't get access to it. And so this is, becomes an important tool because we can moderate this with our irrigation practices. For every extra inch of water that we can add to the available water capacity, we can increase our yield. The other thing to keep in mind is not only is available water important for our crops and the ultimate yield we get from those, but also for supporting that biologic community. Those microbes, things like fungi and bacteri uh, bacteria, live on the films of the water around all those aggregates. So if we allow the soil to dry out, we are affecting that biologic community as well. Some of the factors that influence the amount of available water held in the soil would be things like texture. Sandy soil clearly would not hold as much water as a clay soil. On average, a sandy soil can hold maybe an inch to two inches of available water, versus a heavy clay soil could potentially hold four to six inches of available water. The organic matter content can greatly influence the available water holding capacity because organic matter acts sort of like a sponge in absorbing water and holding it for a longer time in the soil. Structure can certainly influence our soil uh, available water. If you will look at that picture of the soil profile on the right, that's a very typical outwash soil that we have, particularly in northern Illinois. You can see the amount of gravel and rock in there, and as a result, not that much clay, which would influence the amount of water that would be held. So our outwash soils tend to be a drier soil than our glacial till soils. Bulk density or compaction can certainly influence the available water capacity because that's an indication of the fact that we don't have much pore space in the soil and a lot of the water needs to be stored in those medium to small pores. A plow can also destroys the pore space and can influence the root zone. If the plow pan is seven inches below the surface because that's where the tillage plow pan is and that's the depth of tillage, then we have ultimately really limited the available water capacity of that soil for plants to grow in versus having the entire soil profile available for root growth. Up until now, we focused primarily on the physical soil factors of structure and porosity and how that influences water movement in the soil as it influences soil quality. For the next few slides, we'll take a look at how that influences and the impact of soil quality as related to soil biological properties. 
One of the key components to soil quality is the fact that the soil is alive, that there's an abundant soil biological community in that soil contributing to things like nutrient cycling and the filtering of um, pollutants, creating soil structure and making those aggregates stronger. Some of those bacteria and fungi act as deterrents to diseases of our crops. In addition, they help mold the type and amount of organic matter in the soil. In the literature, there's many different research studies demonstrating this fact that in a very small portion of soil, there's literally billions of bacteria and fungi and actinomycetes and viruses and protozoa and all these other creatures that live within the soil in a food web that contribute to the enhancement of our soil properties. Here we see that an uh, example where there's literally billions of our tiniest creatures, the bacteria, all the way up to earthworms. And it seems funny that you would have five earthworms and a teaspoon of soil, but not all earthworms are really big. Some can actually be quite small. If we look at that soil food web, what we see is this incredible complexity underneath our feet, all dependent on what we do as a manager of that soil. Because if you look to the left, you'll see the basis of that soil food web, and that is organic material. That organic material that we add either as cover crops or manure or compost or res crop residue or simply from growing plants that have deep root systems that leave that organic matter in the soil, all create the food which our very tiniest parts of that food web need, the bacteria and fungi. They feed on that organic matter, help us decompose that organic matter, and then help that get bound into the matrix of the soil and this matrix of the soil aggregates to create that stronger structure within our soil and it help increase the quality of that soil. But in addition, while they're doing that, they, by decomposing that organic matter, they're releasing nutrients into the soil. And so all those factors influence the quality of our soil. But that food web is a very balanced food web in general, where you have larger things consuming those smaller things. So we have protozoa or nematodes eating the fungi, which then the, have other things like anthropods eating the nematodes and the birds eating the insects. And as a result, we have this balance that occurs within our soil. So if we want to increase soil quality, we need to focus on that biological community and what do they need. Well, what do they need? They obviously need space to move around in and as a result, that porosity and creating that porosity is important and having the structure to maintain that. Water is critical. A lot of these creatures live in the water films that are around each of those particles. And as a result, we try to maintain a very moist, humid environment in that soil so that they can survive well. Air is critical um, in order for these organisms to grow, so having uh, a lot of open pore space is important. Most important, what we can influence, though, is the food and the organic matter that we're adding back into that soil every year in order for them to decompose it and use it and um, their functions of living. When we've looked at, um, research has looked at what type of organic matter is best, what they found is the bacteria, when they are decomposing material, have an optimum carbon to nitrogen ratio of about 30 carbons to one nitrogen um, in order to most efficiently decompose organic materials. It's been said that we would not even have soil if we did not have all of the living organisms in our soils. And that's because they are such a critical part of the soil creation and development process. Everything from that decomposition of the organic material 
that then helps release nutrients into the soil, allowing plants to quickly, easily take up nutrients that otherwise wouldn't be available, to helping to even bring in nutrients to the soil. For instance, we have rhizobia bacteria that are associated with the root system of legume plants that help fix nitrogen from the air and release it um, for the plants in a form that the plants can take it up. And in return, then, the plants um, provide sugars and other things that the rhizobia bacteria need. So it's called a symbiotic relationship because each of those are mutually beneficial. Mycorrhiza fungi also do the same thing with many plants. They um, affect, infect the root system, either on the exterior or interior of the root, and act sort of like root hairs, helping the plant take up more water, and in many cases, actually helping the plant to extract more phosphorus from the soil in order for the plant to take it up. So there's many contributions in that manner that plant organis or many organisms do. We've already talked a couple times now about how particularly fungi are very important in their ability to help create stronger aggregates by helping bind together those particles either by the hyphae or by some of the materials that are exuded by those organisms. Lastly, we haven't visited much, but those soil organisms also help keep other things in check particularly our plant pests, um, some of our um, nematodes, our other pathogens like fungi um, that uh, could potentially cause diseases of our crops by having a very well-balanced, active soil biological community. Those organisms tend to be kept in check and as a result, we have less disease in healthy soils than in uh, other soils. We've now talked about some of the major factors that influence soil quality and we're going to move on to talk about some of the ways that we can manage our soil quality to encourage an active biological community, um, increase organic matter, and minimize tillage. When we look at soil quality and trying to improve soil quality, there are some properties of soils that simply can't be changed readily by our management. Things like texture, that clay mineralogy, the drainage class, um, how high that water table occurs in our soils throughout the growing season. Some of those things are just not things that we can easily um, change or economically um, change. And as a result, we're very limited in our management of those. But there are a few things that we have some dramatic impact on, depending on the way we manage the soil. Things like the organic matter content, the structure um, that occurs and the strength of that structure, bulk density and whether or not we can pack the soil. And as a result, we influence the water and nutrient holding capacities of the soils. So let's talk a little bit about some of the things that we can do to improve soil quality. You've probably figured out already that in order to create better soil quality, adding organic materials on a regular basis greatly improves the percentage of soil organic matter in our soils. And that the higher soil organic matter that we have, then the more nutrient holding capacity we have, the higher water holding capacity, the stronger aggregate stability, and overall, better soil quality. What we would like to see is the soil organic matter content being at least 1% um, organic matter, but preferably we'd like to see our soils being closer to 5 to 6% organic matter. And at that point we have enough organic matter to have some really positive influences on other aspects of the soil. Now when we actually look at organic matter, that organic matter portion of the soil is made up of quite a number of different things, not just one. The typical little circle that you see at the bottom is how we represent soils, where we have 45% mineral portion of that solid part of the soil, and that would be your rocks ground down into sand and silt and clay. And the organic matter content, when we say it's 5%, 
actually is made up of many different things from living organisms that are still alive, but their bodies count when we grind them up and measure soil organic matter, to a lot of the active parts of the organic matter content that are going to now be decomposed over the next few years and have been recently added in the last couple of years, which oftentimes is about 10 to 20 percent of organic matter. But the vast majority of organic matter is actually material that's been um, decomposing over many, many decades to centuries actually in the soil. So when you look at soil organic matter, part of that organic matter is that biomass, the living organisms that are there. The other portion is that which is slowly being decomposed. And it's that active organic matter that we want to have an influence over with our management practices because that's the material that the organisms are actually consuming and eating in order to multiply and add all the other benefits that those organisms can do. The active organic matter is considered to be that portion which has been there for months to years in the soil as it slowly decomposes. As the proteins and sugars and other things get consumed by the um, uh, biological community, then it re the, some of the more difficult portions of that organic matter remain that are much more difficult for things like bacteria and fungi to decompose. Those would be the parts of the cell walls, the lignin and cellulose, and those then become what we call humus. It's what remains in the soil for long term. Some is estimated to be as much as a thousand years old still remaining in the soil. What can be really important in this diagram is to understand that when we do an organic matter test and it reads that we have 5% organic matter, we don't have any clue as to the proportion of humus to active organic matter in that soil. And as a result, we could potentially have 5% organic matter with basically a fairly dead soil because there isn't part of that organic matter that is active organic material that supports the biological community. If we are adding organic matter every year in the form of cover crops or uh, manure or other sources, then we are on an annual basis adding back in a portion of that active organic matter that's supporting the biological community. So we could have 5% organic matter, but have a very abundant live soil that's releasing nutrients and cycling nutrients and holding water in the long run for um, our crops. So the fact that we can do a soil test measurement at this point doesn't always indicate the quality of the soil um, as well as we would really, really like to. Scientists are working on new tests that will allow us to do that. And it won't be too many more years probably before uh, a farmer will be able to ask for a test of the active portion of the organic matter. The active or changeable organic matter in the soil that we have the most influence over from a management perspective. Every time we use cover crops or use add compost or manure or com mushroom compost or um, any other soil amendment, we're adding that organic matter that provides the most nutrients as well as energy value in the way of sugars for those biological organisms in the soil. And as we turn, those organisms are actually most active. We have the highest populations as a result of that. And as a result, we oftentimes see more aggregation of and creation of soil structure. We see more nutrient mineralization and the release of things like nitrogen and phosphorus and sulfur, as well as micronutrients into the soil. And in fact, um, nitrogen is one of those things that the, the organic matter is the only source of nitrogen in the soil unless we use fertilizers to add nitrogen. And as a result, adding this organic matter is critical to the cycling of nitrogen in the soil and the release of that to our plants. This part of organic matter is also most sensitive to our management changes and therefore it's difficult to change 
um, the overall percentage of organic matter when we're adding this type of organic matter because it tends to be consumed by the organisms. The passive or more humic organic material that's left over after the initial decomposition of the material is also very important from a long-term perspective. It tends to be a little bit more physically protected um, from decomposition. It also tends to be the materials that are more difficult to uh, decompose, like the lignans and cellulose out of cell walls. But as a result of that, that material actually has a lot of negative charges on it and adds considerably to the um, cation exchange capacity or the overall nutrient holding capacity of the soil. And so it has a key role in water holding capacity um, of our soils. We can increase the organic matter content of our soil by using uh, crop residues and making sure that any crop residues that are left after the season get incorporated into the soil or are left there as a mulch and we'll let the organisms, the earthworms and other creatures, bring that down into the soil for us um, as a mulch. Um, but those are very um, efficient ways of adding organic matter. We can also use a varied uh, residues to maintain diverse populations of organisms. Um, if you think about a doctor telling you to eat a wide variety of foods to get all your nutrients, well it's sort of the same thing in organic matter. If you think about uh, say leaves off of a tree versus a legume cover crop, well you can imagine there's quite a bit of difference in nutrient content, carbon content, um, and so forth in those two different materials and the influence that those would have then in the soil once they've been incorporated. So using a variety of residues, a variety of crops in our management system can actually increase the quality of our organic matter and overall soil quality then of our, our soils. Something else to think about that we've not talked about much is trying to balance the farm nutrient export with the import of the nutrients that we have so that we don't begin to build excessive nutrients in our soils. We'd like to have the, the uh, reason um, for adding those nutrient additions and organic matter helps us balance that out. Other things to think about is to have practices that don't accelerate the decomposition of organic matter or to potentially erode off that topsoil of our soil because it is the topsoil that tends to have the highest accumulation of organic matter in the soil um, because that's where most of it's being incorporated. So we certainly don't want to have erosion and, and lose that. Uh, other ways we might accelerate decomposition would be by excessive tillage. The more we expose those um, aggregates and so forth to oxygen, then uh, the, the more microbes we have that would decompose the organic matter within those aggregates. Uh, excessive nitrogen fertilization actually can decrease organic matter co um, content because um, of that carbon nitrogen ba ratio that we talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, excessive nitrogen allows larger populations of um, bacteria in particular and therefore more decomposition. One of the other things that we can manage is the degree to which we till the soil. Traditional tillage using a mobile plow, um, as you're seeing here, can really disrupt the soil aggregation, expose the aggregates to air. Um, if we have fungi particularly living in that soil, it can greatly disrupt the um, extent of uh, spread of those hyphae within the soil and as a result the soils become much more susceptible to things like compaction, erosion, and uh, lack of organic matter. Now obviously as we are doing farming we have to till the soil to some degree. We need to incorporate some organic matters deeper down in the soil or add some fertilizer and incorporate that deeper into the soil. So we do need some tillage even to uh, plant our, our crop for the most part. But what we would like to aim for is to minimize that tillage 
or to do what we call sustainable tillage, where anything that we're doing would minimize compaction, minimize loss of aggregation, increase infiltration of the soil, uh, um, water uh, rather than allowing it to run off and eroding our soils. And all those things will benefit that biological community uh, while hopefully maintaining some residue cover to minimize the impact of that raindrop and potential crusting of the soil. Many sustainable tillage and cultivation um, possibilities and uh, equipment out there and this is definitely one of those areas that there's been a lot of work on and, and even more exciting things coming from research or from farmer innovation to get the seed in the ground while minimizing the disturbance. So we have undercutters and roller choppers available. Um, mulch tillage is quite successful. Um, No-till um, definitely takes a little bit of expertise and time to get the system to work, but those who have been no-tilling for a long time are very happy with it. Dist plant or chisel planting is probably one of the more common ways that conservation sustainable tillage is used. Ridge tillage um, has some advantages of uh, creating a ridge and planting on top of that to create some airspace and water movement in that soil, especially on a heavier clay soil, and then of course strip tillage. So when looking at your tillage options, uh, don't uh, assume that there's only one, one way to till the soil. Um, each of them has their advantages and disadvantages, and certainly consider the impact on overall soil quality before committing to one piece of equipment over another. The impact of one type of tillage over another may not be so obvious. We do have to look at the entire system and all the ways that our tillage can impact all the different physical and chemical and biological properties of our soil. And to do that, we're going to show you a couple of research studies on the difference between no-till and organic systems. Well, no-till is where we have the least amount of disturbance due to tillage. Uh, of that soil, and yet on the opposite end we have organic systems where oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes uh, the farmer is relying on numerous tillage passes and cultivation of the soil in order to minimize weed control. And as a result, you would expect that in an organic system that there would be quite a bit of damage to that soil, um, poor aggregation, and as a result poor infiltration or erosion, etc. And yet, um, we have to look at the entire system. So let's go and look at a, a couple of different research studies. Here we have the results of a study um, that looked at no-till versus organic matter content. And what you're looking at on the left is the amount of total soil carbon or organic material, would be another way to um, look at that, in the soil over the depth in the soil profile, going from zero um, centimeters all the way down to 30 centimeters, or about 15 inches. And if you look at that, you'll see that over the depth of the soil, the organic system actually had higher levels of organic carbon or organic matter in that soil. And as a result, over time and looking at soil quality, that even though there's to be more tillage going on, because of all the additions within that organic system of organic materials, such as the use of cover crops or the additions of manure or compost into that soil, that that addition of organic matter is actually benefiting the soil and you don't see as many problems with that soil as you would um, if you had a lot of tillage without those organic matter additions. In this data what we see is a comparison of no-till and organic um, uh, systems looking at overall grain yield uh, as well as the nitric content of the soil and as well as the protein content of the ear leaf. And so in the no-till system, we're seeing that the yield was actually less than the organic matter system and that the nitrogen content of the soil was actually greater, um, particularly due to the increase in organic matter content of the soil underneath the organic system 
in contrast to the no-till system. So again, once again, we can see that despite the fact that organic systems tend to utilize tillage a great deal um, by the fat matter that they have added so much organic matter into the system, it tends to buffer those impacts and you can actually achieve greater yields uh, with an organic system than a, a no-till system uh, under these circumstances. So no matter what kind of tillage we're using, um, any time that we can incorporate into our road crop rotation perennial crops uh, that eliminate uh, tillage for a few years, for instance, a hay or pasture crop, something like that, or something putting into the uh, system, some cover crops, um, those are always beneficial to give an opportunity for that organic matter to be incorporated into that soil matrix. Other recommendations would be to utilize mechanically killed or uh, winter killed cover crop residues. Those really help suppress weeds rather than using a, a great deal of tillage. And then lastly, any time that we can use continuous no-till um, in an organic system, that would be great. Uh, it has shown some success, especially in uh, using uh, pumpkins or uh, squash, some kinds of cucurbits such as that, uh, where those um, cover crops are either crimped or rolled over and used as a base or a mulch for those crops. But for other vegetables, using a no-till system in organic is uh, definitely much more challenging and uh, a lot more research is needed to use it effectively. In summary of how to manage to improve soil quality, uh, anytime that we can encourage a more active biological community, we will definitely add benefits to our soil and increase soil quality. One of the best ways to do that is to simply add new organic materials every single year that adds that active portion of the organic material that the biological community needs in order to eat, survive, multiply, and then do a lot of other really good things for the soil, like release nutrients and increase soil aggregate stability. Well, we can increase and enhance the organic matter content of our soil by keeping the ground covered we don't want to have that topsoil eroded away. That is the highest amount of organic matter in our soil in that A horizon. Certainly by diversifying our cropping systems, by looking at our crop rotation, can we add in perhaps a hay crop or a pasture for a couple of years that will add organic matter back into a soil that otherwise is very intensely used, particularly in our vegetable and fruit production. The addition of our cover crops is a really short-term, quick impact kind of strategy we can use to add organic material, not only in that surface material that's in, uh, added back into the cover crop, but choosing something like annual ryegrass that has a very deep root system that um, can help create porosity and continuity of pores from the surface deeper down into that soil. Other things we can do to enhance organic matter and improve overall so soil quality would be to reduce disturbance of that soil. So something like polyculture is something that's new and upcoming as an opportunity to minimize disturbance of our soils. Orchards um, certainly um, do that and trying to maintain a cover uh, within the, between the rows of our trees or vineyards. Uh, other things such as reducing or rotating the type of tillage that we're doing can always add, uh, reduce the impacts of uh, too much tillage and that we have to do. Lastly then, anytime we can minimize and reduce tillage, the better. Uh, overall, our goal there is to minimize compaction of that soil and the creation of some of those plow layers or destruction of overall soil structure of our soils. This lecture has been a quick overview about soil quality, what it is, and some of the soil quality factors that we can actually look at and measure and determine whether or not we are improving or hurting 
the overall soil quality of our soil by looking at things like aggregate stability, a quick simple test that we can do in the field, looking at porosity uh, and airspace in the soil, doing a quick infiltration test on our soil to determine how fast water is moving into the soil. We can measure the available water holding capacity of our soil and know whether or not we're increasing or decreasing that by our additions of organic material. We can also do assessments of the biological community, do an earthworm count in March or September and see whether or not we are have enough food in our soil to support a very active biological community. Lastly, there's certainly things that we can are doing within our soils management to impact soil quality. Anytime we can add organic materials to the soil to increase the long-term organic matter content of the soil, we're going to improve soil quality. And the last thing we definitely want to do is try to minimize tillage that can have some negative impacts on aggregate stability, um, st amount of structure, um, the biological community of our soils. Soil quality is certainly one of those factors that we have a lot of management opportunities to improve uh, our soil um, with, and I hope that today's lesson has given you some ideas of ways to incorporate those management strategies into your farming system.